Hi everybody, Speedy Delivery. My name is David Newell, and I have been on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Have you all heard of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? And I guess you've seen it at some point, right? Well, uh, I know this is not a really a lecture. I'm not a, a, le a lecturing, nor am I an inspirational speaker. I just thought I'd come along and tell you about my many years with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And the theme tonight, today is happiness and how much happiness that has brought me over, over the years, and, and Fred Rogers, too. Uh, so I thought I'd start with, uh, from the back and work forwards, but before that, I have uh, a few notes. I've made uh, two pages of notes trying to condense 45 years into 20 minutes. So uh, I'll be jumping around a lot, and a little later if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And I brought uh, some photos that uh, I can sign if you have uh, kids or you want one for yourself, feel free to stay. And if you can't wait, uh, you have to get to work, just leave your card and I'll mail them to you. I'll make a speedy delivery. <laughs> so. Here's what I thought we, we could do. I brought a clip from the very last show we did, and that was in 2001, I believe. We did a, a week of programs that sort of, it, it wasn't a week that summed anything up, but it, to us, I guess it was. And in this particular clip, uh, I was singing my speedy delivery song to Fred, and uh, he always got a biggest kick out of me singing because I'm not a singer. And if we were running late on time or we were not, did, we had more time than we could use, he would say, now Mr. Refuley, can you sing your speedy delivery song? And then I'd take off and sing it. So that's what happened in this little sequence you're about to see. But what I did, uh, so, since it was my last appearance of the two of us on camera together, I shook his hand as I was leaving. Now that's not a big, uh, but to me it was a signal, and it was a me saying thank you for these many, f these many years that we've worked together, and it was just my own little signal. So this is only about two minutes, and if you have it, it's, well, it's right here, I believe. Why don't you just start it, you can see that, and then I'll go from there and explain many years in the neighborhood. Speedy delivery. It's a work of art in itself, Mr. McPhee. Well, I like making all kinds of pictures. I did this with a video camera. Oh, it's just beautiful the way you wove all of those forms of art together. Well, I thought you'd enjoy it. I certainly did. I have more deliveries to do right now, but before I go, I want you to always remember that if there's anything you want, if there's anything you need, Sing it with you? Oh, sure. All right. There we go. Let's sing it with Mr. McFeely. If there's anything you want, if there's anything you need, feelings of every person to you here with me. Yes, I see. in his film. Some people surprise us in this life. But I think it's important to look for what people are able to do. And once you find it, appreciate it. Let's have some night Does that bring back some memories? That was the last scene where Fred and I were together on camera. He, uh, as you probably know, Fred had uh, 
stomach cancer and died about two years later uh, in 2003. But what a life it was working with that man. He was a gentle soul. Uh, what you see is what you get. He, he was the true thing, the real thing. There was no artifice to him. And I'll just back up a little bit and tell you how I got to his neighborhood and how he got to the neighborhood to begin with. And I thought I'd start with, uh, oh yes, I'll start with me. Uh, well, I, I didn't go to college right away. I went uh, uh, to get a job. And I got a job here in Pittsburgh at the National Cash Register Company as a gopher, really. And I was there for about a year, and uh, they laid me off. It was the recession, and so I lo the, the first come, first goes. And uh, so that, that really changed my life, that, that one, because I may have stayed there for a while, because you could get into the management, or but I didn't like it. Uh, Nothing wrong with it, but I didn't, I didn't like that. So uh, when I was laid off, I, I happened to be looking in the paper, and there was a, uh, an advertisement for the Pittsburgh Playhouse School of the Theater. And this is a theater which has been here for years. And I enrolled. It was a two-year program, very intensive in theater, in directing and acting, in production, all of that. And that's how I began. And it was really, it was really, uh, Providence, I guess, that I, I saw that advertisement because it's something I really wanted to do. And those years at Pittsburgh Playhouse and the School of the Theater and working behind the scenes were wonderful years. I, I loved every moment of it. And I think there's a saying, uh, something about uh, find the job that you love because you won't, won't work a day in your life, something like that. Anyhow, that's what 45 years ha have meant to me. It's made me very happy working in, in theater, even in behind the stage and in, in, in the front of the stage. It's something that I, I, I wanted to do ever since I was five years old. My grandfather, in fact, I was in this theater when it was showing movies, but my grandfather would take me to the theater every weekend, a movie or a play. And my first play was downtown at the Nixon Theater. It was Harvey. There's a play called Harvey about a man who thinks he sees a white rabbit. You've probably heard of it. At any rate, that was my first a play, a professional company. And I came home and I recreated the play in our basement by, my, by myself. I played all the parts. And it was really something I thought I wanted to do. And I did it. And somehow something led to me, led that, to see that ad in the paper about the Pittsburgh Playhouse. and. Here I am. I never thought I'd be here in this theater where I've seen movies when I was four or five years old talking to all of you. But it's made me extremely happy. Uh, well, okay, that gets me into uh, the theater of sorts by studying, and oh yes, that's the other thing. Uh, the Playhouse had matinees of children's theater on the weekends. Professional actors would do it. They, were, they weren't thrown together. They were well thought out. Uh, and they had a host of the theater, the, the plays, and I was the clown. There was a clown. His name was Bimbo. <laughs> now, you can't do that now, but you could then. <laughs> but I was Bimbo the clown, and I would introduce. It was a, sta a theater about like this. And they would do Rumpelstiltskin and Cinderella, the, the, the typical children's theater, but they were excellently done. And I would introduce the, the children to the theater, because it's really been my passion too, I, I, uh, is to get people to go to theater. And by the way, there's so many theater organizations in Pittsburgh that you should, you should sample if you already haven't. But that, so I was hoping that I would be helping children, this is going back to the late, mid 60s, introduce them to theater. And so then I'll skip over to Fred now. Uh, so all this is coming together. Uh, Fred was in New York City working for NBC. He was working on, because his background is in is music, and he has a, a, had a degree in uh, three things, music, uh, theology, and uh, child development. And all those eventually worked into his producing the program. But he was at NBC working on these big shows back in the 50s. NBC was the fast track to 
being successful in television. It was the beginning of television. If you got into it then, you had it made. Um, and so Fred was working on a show called The Hit Parade that probably none of you have ever heard of, but it was a big, big show in the 50s, the top 10 songs of the week. And he worked on uh, the NBC Opera Theater. Can you imagine NBC carrying opera today? But they did then. But he loved music. That's why he got into that end of it. But he heard that WQED was opening in Pittsburgh, which is the public station in Pittsburgh, and he wanted to go and be on the ground floor of this thing called public television. And the people there said, you're crazy, you don't, don't leave here, you're, you've got it made, you'll be a director, you'll be a producer, you, you're on the training um, team now. He said, no, I want to go. And he left and he came to Pittsburgh, back to Pittsburgh, he's from Latrobe, and started, helped start WQED in 1953. And actually it went on the air in 1954 with a program called The Children's Corner, which was a big hit locally in, in Pittsburgh. And that's how it all started. And what made him the happiest was the music. He would write the music and has written all the music for, that he used on the, on the neighborhood. And what that made him very, he never wanted to be a television star. That, that came with the territory. He never really wanted to be in front of the camera. But the CBC saw the Children's Corner, that's Canadian Broadcasting, and they brought Fred to Canada in Toronto. And that's where Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood began in 1961, I believe. And he came in front of the camera, and the rest is history. That's where he started. And then he came back to the States, and there were a few regional versions of it. But in 1967, I got a telegram. I was in London at the time visiting my cousin who was living there. I got a telegram from the, uh, at the American Express office. That's how you did things then, no email. And, and I, it said that Fred Rogers is, is taking the neighborhood nationally, meaning nationally in the States. And my mutual friend, and I've set up an appointment for you. And when you get back to Pittsburgh and you're to see him and talk about the possibility of working on the show. So I came back and we talked for about an hour and I was the last person to be interviewed and he hired me. And I don't think I, it's just, again, Providence, I don't think I'd be standing here now if that hadn't have happened, if that mutual friend had in, uh, come between and brought us both together. And it's been such a wonderful uh, 45 years. I, I can't tell you, I looked forward to going to work. And again, if find something you enjoy because it really brings happiness. Now, the, uh, working in a job isn't your total life happiness, but what happened for me is that I was there for about 10 years and I met, I met my wife. She came uh, to work uh, as a producer at the neighborhood. She had moved to Pittsburgh and it just so happened that uh, the job is open as a producer and that's where we met. And the combination of the two has made it a wonderful, wonderful career and personal life. And we have three children and now three grandchildren. And it, it really has been, I've been very happy doing that. Now it's not all bluebirds and roses, but there are Television's a tough business. Even children's television is, t is, a, is a tough business. Very, very expensive and very competitive. And it, it comes down to ratings, even in public television. Ratings is something that they're now considering because underwriters who want to give money to public television want to know how much they're getting for their so-called donation. So, but what public television enabled Fred Rogers to do, it wasn't canceled because it gave us time to grow over the years. It, you know, you, some, in commercial television, and there's nothing wrong with that, that's the nature of the beast. You don't get the ratings, you are out, somebody else comes in. But in public television, they gave us a chance to grow and, and to hone the program and to take subjects that might be helpful to, to families. And that's what has made me very happy in, in, in a job is being able to take subjects. For instance, there is a, uh, before glasnost happened in, in Russia, you know, there was all this 
Cold War going on, and there probably still is, but uh, I, I thought, well, why can't we, as a television program, visit our counterpart in Russia and vice versa? And we did. Fred went to Russia, and there was a, a woman there who had a program called Good Night Little Ones, uh, and her name was Tatiana Vendeneva, and she was all over Russia, it, 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 and it was a program that children would look at before they go to bed. Now, who would think in Russia there would be a very sensitive program like that, but that just shows you we don't know everybody's culture. But at any rate, I thought, Fred, do you think that we could do something, it, it just symbolically, it might represent that people can get along from different countries. Let's just start with that and show children that there is a way of, of ha different cultures getting along and understanding each other. And, and then she came here and uh, visited our program. So it was a, it was a, a it was, what do they call that? A, a, a big, a big meet, there's a name for that, and I can't remember. But at any rate, uh, but it was very interesting. When she came to, uh, she came to D.C. first because we took her to the Russian embassy and they had a reception. But she, and this is before Russia was open, she went around to the, to the department stores in, Los, in D.C. and was fascinated. The one thing she wanted to look at were earrings. The, the, they were just, to her, they were, I guess you don't have earrings in Russia, but she wanted, she couldn't stop uh, buying the earrings. And it was, it was very interesting. And the other subject we did, oh, here's what I'll tell you. Fred did, uh, and this is, this is, probably sums up the program. Fred uh, had a degree in uh, music. He had a degree in uh, theology and was working, and part of the assignment of the theology was to, to observe children in the Arsenal Child Care uh, Center, which was part of Pitt at the time. And he did. Um, he'd go over and ob observe children at their play because you can find out a lot about what children are thinking, young children, through what they're doing and how they interact with other children and how they play. Uh, at any rate, every parent would come in once a week, a different parent would come in and show what they do for a living. Uh, one, uh, Fred said one person was a uh, a truck driver and brought in a, his bakery truck, I think, and they went on the parking lot and saw that. Another person was a telephone repair person, we brought his phone in and showed that. Another person was a sculptor, an artist, and he came in, didn't say a word, and plopped down a big chunk of clay, uh, the artist, that very soft clay, and started to make a, a, a simple sculpture. And the children observed them. And he didn't give them any direction, he just did it. Didn't say, now here I'm doing this, he just did it. And the children ob observed that. But what I think, and it goes back to happiness too, what I think is uh, if you love what you do in front of children, as this sculptor did, they'll catch it. There's a, there's a saying, a Quaker saying, say, uh, attitudes are caught, not taught. And that's what those children were doing. They were catching this person's love of his art. And f for weeks after that person visited, their, their sculptures were phenomenal. A big difference. But they caught it. And I think that's what uh, children do when they watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And it all comes back to Fred's happiness with what he's doing. Uh, they would catch what he was saying. Um, another another one uh, instance is that uh, he wrote a song called "What Do You Do with the Mad That You Feel When You Feel So Mad You Could Bite." Well, that came directly from a young child who, when Fred was observing, came up and asked him those exact words, and and Fred turned it into a song. And what it was is that it gives you alternative ways of children, alternative ways of expressing their anger. You don't run up and hit someone, you don't, you don't use an, any kind of a weapon. You go up and, and you can talk through. Now that's the perfect scenario. It doesn't always happen that way, but why not start? And, and, and there were uh, themes like that sprinkled through the whole series that 
I felt, and it made me so good to be part, feel good to be part of that, to be able to, to work on a program that is offering families something tangible that they can take away from this program. Oh, the one of the, another reason that Fred got into public television is he, on a, one of his breaks from college, he came home and saw children's programming, and it was people throwing pies at each other. And they, what they were were the was Three Stooges or some of the slapstick comedies all just strung together, and they showed them for the, you know, comedy capers. That was the children's uh, bef uh, programming for that station. And he said, we can do better than that. He said, there's nothing wrong with slapstick. That's an art form, but not for children constantly. Let's take something and uh, create something that would demand their attention. And he said, Who's, who would say that uh, uh, the attention span of a child is very short? Let's, let's uh, create a program that, that concentrates on, on calling the, the to, to uh, what's the word I want to use, to uh, develop their attention span. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's hard to stand here and try to think of 45 years of what we've done, but my point being that we've, we have uh, been very happy doing, doing that. And the only, oh, here's, an, the, and Fred starting uh, at NBC and leaving, was a decision too. I think you make your, I think happiness, if that's the word, is in your own decision. It, it was, Fred could have stayed there and made a lot of money, more than you do in public television, but he decided he was following what, his heart. And his heart was taking what he knew, children, music, and theology, and, and using them all in one package, so to speak. And it became a program that uh, I don't, uh, I don't, th when we started, I thought I had a job for one year. I thought, okay, I'll do this for one year, and then I'll, uh, I'll go back to Los Angeles where I was living at the time, and here I am in, in, in Pittsburgh and, and been very happy. So if <laughs> uh, you're unhappy in a job, and jobs aren't the only thing where you can find happiness, I think there's a healthy combination of everything. But for me, it was that. It was a healthy combination of uh, a family life and a career, and a career that m meant so much to me, and a family life that meant so much to me. But I think you have to work at it, because it's a demanding field, television. You're away a lot. I, I, I travel a lot. I'm still making deliveries. I, <laughs> I go to uh, next week or the week after, I go to Illinois, and there's a museum there who a children's museum who's showing uh, one of our exhibits, who is exhibiting one of our exhibits. And I go there and we have a sweater drive uh, and we give the sweaters to people who could use them. So it's been such a rewarding 45 years. And by the way, February 19th, 19, yes, that would be. We started in 1968 and this is 2013. Isn't that 45 years? Yes, it is 45 years. This is our 45th anniversary on February 19th of, so on, on television. And it is still on the air on the weekends. And we have uh, another program we've started, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. And that's on every day on public television around the country. Oh, I brought. I've got a guessing game for you. I brought something in this bag. See if you can tell me some of these puppets. I'll bring it out. Uh, and somebody give me a high sign when I'm running over. Do you know who this is? I'll tell you, say, uh, say hello, Daniel, humor me. <laughs> That's Daniel Tiger. Do you, do, you remember, do you remember Daniel? And he's the one who lives in a clock and uh, he, uh, uh, Fred did his voice, and he did the voices of most of the puppets, and I would be his assistant behind the, the set, and Fred would put this puppet up, and on the inside of the clock, there'd be a script with circles around Daniel's voice, and there would be a monitor, so you could see what Fred could see, and then the actor would come up to the clock and the scene would begin. But that's Daniel Tiger, and he lives in a clock with no hands, because in the neighborhood of make-believe, it's timeless. Uh, 
also the neighborhood let me explain a little bit about the neighborhood of make believe when fred comes in and takes his sweater and puts a sweater and sneakers on there symbolize play clothes and then we go to the neighborhood of make believe with the tra transition object of the trolley and then they play through the theme and back again fred wanted to separate for young children fantasy in reality and that's why the the change of the sweater and the and the going to the neighborhood to make believe in the trolley all that symbolizes something and when he comes in it's very subtle he walks from left to right and that's how children learn to read the 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 program was so th thought through and well i'll put daniel away for a second then i want to show you two others but i wanted to i just thought of this one story um, fred went to india one year with other uh, american television producers to create a a program for uh, children's television in india it was sort of a pilot uh, and they wrote it together as a as a team and then they taped it and during the taping there was a cue that was missed the doorbell didn't ring or some sound effect didn't go off and fred said oh well, i think we should stop and do that one again and the one of the production people who was with him said oh it's just a kid show and fred said that's my point uh, we need to make, do what best we can for children, as good as you would do for an adult programming. And that's the care he put into the program. And that discipline has, I think, rubbed off on me. But I think I was ready to take that discipline when I was going into the program because he was so much uh, determined to change children's television for the better or to influence it. You know, you, know you, you, you can't change the world's ills with one television program, but you can do the best you can. But I think that, ch that children knew that he respected them and respected childhood. And Fred had a wonderful sense of humor. I think what I'll do, do we have enough time? I was going to, uh, we have an outtake on that reel that I brought. And it's not very long, it's only about two and a half, three minutes, but I'll set it up. It shows Fred's sense of humor too. Uh, we keep starting over again and people say, why didn't you just stop? Well, Fred in his economical producer's mind thought, okay, I won't stop, I'll do it again and we can edit. So what this is, and I, it, it, you can hear eventually the, the cameraman laughing in the background. It is, uh, Fred comes out to the side yard and tries to put a tent up. One of those tents you push down and like an umbrella and it, all of a sudden there it is. See that? Looks a little like a teepee, doesn't it? Of course, a teepee is a real home for some people. Yeah. More. 
Dick Clark wanted the outtakes, and he used this one. It got a lot of, I think if you look on the, online, it's still roaming around online, the outtakes. It has uh, uh, millions of hits, I think. Um, how much time do we have left? Is, is Kate around somewhere? I, I can, oh, yes? Do I have what, five minutes? No, Q&A now? Let's do your, the rest of your puppets. Oh, the rest of the puppets. Oh, okay. And then we'll do Q&A after that. Uh, okay, and then if, if you have questions, I also have pictures. I could go on for another hour, but you have to get to work. So uh, here is, now this is not the real one. This one looks like the real one. And it's, a, it's a puppet of a puppet. His name is, I bet you know, King. Friday, that's King Friday. Now the real King Friday is about this tall and it's now in the Fred Rogers Center in uh, Latrobe. They have a Fred Rogers Center where all the archives are stored, the, uh, the, all of Fred's writings, the scripts, everything, and the puppets are there too. But I take these puppets around when I visit uh, daycare centers because this, is, this can take a lot of abuse. But oh, here's a song that Fred wrote for King Friday and uh, it's to row, row, row your boat. And when I'm visiting uh, daycares, I'll have them sing row, row, row your boat. So pretend you've just done that. And then King Friday has this, he sings, uh, propel, propel, propel your craft swiftly down liquid solution ecstatically 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 existence is but an illusion that's King Friday's version of row 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 your boat now I have another one more oh this one oh this one is just an old sock puppet and we used it on the program in certain incidences he's a donkey and it's an old sock the puppets were very very uh, basic uh, but Don Quixote actually moves his mouth, but his name is Donkey is his first name, and Hody, H-O-D-I is his second name, Don Quixote. Kids don't get it, but you do probably. <laughs> but that's Don Quixote, and Fred did all the voices, almost all the voices. He did Don Quixote, he did King Friday, he did Lady Elaine, and this one more puppet I'll show, and this one's a fairly popular one. You can see him actually now on the new series. But it is the actual size of, it's an owl. His name is, do you know? X, you knew, right? X the owl, and he lives in a tree right next to Henrietta. Now on the new series, it's all second generation, and X has a son whose name is O, O the owl. And Daniel, the Daniel you see here that was on the neighborhood, has a son, and he is the host of the new program called Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. The trolley's on, but it's all animated. And if you have a chance, it's on QED and around the country in, in the mornings. You're all at working, but if you get a chance, tune in because it might bring back a lot of memories. And the neighborhood's on the weekend. It's online. Tell friends that they can go on the line, online anytime and see Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Plus, you can get it from Amazon.com. The people are buying the first year of programs that were in black and white. They're really selling, and it goes back to probably a lot of you who, who watched it uh, when you were growing up. Did you all see it at some point? It, it, it was around the country, and it still is. But that's X the Owl, and I just thought I'd show you this. I'm pulling out things right and left. There's so much to tell you. Let's see if there's anything on here I've forgotten. I wanted to tell you as much as I could before you had to leave. Uh, Oh, I, have, I wrote a little thing that says, be careful what you wish for, because it may come true. Well, that's basically what I did. I, I, I wished that I could get into television and theater. And Fred wrote a song to, um, but wishes don't make things come true. It's something that you have to do. It comes from the inside of you. And that's what he was always telling children. He, he, wa he wasn't sugarcoating anything. He dealt with divorce. He, he dealt with, uh, uh, we did a special after Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. And it was talking about the word assassination. You know, and I think if he were still living, he would have done something after this, terrible tragedy. Uh, he would have done something, and I don't know what that something would be, but I think he would have dressed it in some way. And every time there was something like uh, 
something happened to Kennedy or uh, Martin Luther King. He did something to address all of that, to help children get through. And the one thing he would tell children, you know, what can we do? What can we do after something like that happens? But he always said, look for the helpers. When this tragedy strikes, there's always people around helping the best they can to help. And I think that helps children know that there are people there who, who are out to help and be good and responsible. So that's how we use television. And going back to, to, to happiness, it really made me very happy to be able to work with a person with that insight. He dealt with a lot of things uh, years ago before anybody addressed children about what's happening in the world. When there was an assassination attempt on Reagan's life, and we did a special after that called Violence in the News, and he wanted to interpret. Oh, can I say one more thing? <laughs> one more. Uh, it's an example of how, uh, and you re can relate to this, there's a movie called Wizard of Oz, which I'm sure you've seen. And in the movie, there's a witch and the flying monkeys. And they show it all the time on television. And more people have told us, boy, those monkeys still scare me. They're adults now. And that witch, I have nightmares. And they said that happened to them when they were growing up watching that mo movie. So uh, I said, Fred, I think we should call Margaret Hamilton. She's the actress who played the witch. And we did, and to ask her to be on the program and to de demystify these scary things for young children. Because a lot of children see, see a scary, no, I'm talking about young children, see a scary something on television and think that can come out of the television set. But Margaret Hamilton came dressed in her civilian clothes and brought a costume that looked like the one she wore in The Wizard and explained that she's an actress and this is her job. And that job, too, made her very happy. And th that visit made her very happy because she knew that that was one of the problems with her character. And she was a wonderful person. And, and uh, she became a good family friend after that meeting uh, when our second child was born. She flew from New York City to, to see him. And the, the, the people I've met and the, the, the supportive people I've met through through working with Fred and, and being able to create television that supports families has been just, a, a, just a, a, a blessing to me. And it made me very happy. And I, and I hope that what you all do uh, makes you happy. And you know, if it doesn't, think about it. Because Fred did the same thing. He left a, a good paying job to come to st start something that wasn't even on the air yet and stayed with it because it made him happy. So that's my little, uh, my little to-do on happiness. And, and do I have one thing? I just want to make sure I, I haven't forgotten anything. Oh, can I tell you one more thing? <laughs> this, has, this has nothing to do with happiness, but it's very funny. Oh, it does have, I guess it does. Uh, do you remember Eddie Murphy? And do you remember Saturday Night Live and Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood? Okay, well, they, uh, the Saturday Night Live producer would call me, because my other hat was I did the PR for the program, call me every Monday morning when Eddie was on Saturday Night Live and did those takeoffs on Fred. Well, he said, do you think Fred could come on and surprise Eddie? We'll have Eddie, we won't tell him. He'll come on and he'll open the door when there's a knock on the door saying, Robinson, you know, it was always a, somebody after him, and it would be Fred. Well, Fred said, oh, I don't know if I can do that. You know, I, I, so uh, before that, the reason that they, he did call me was Fred was on the David Letterman show when it was on NBC. And somebody said, go up and surprise Eddie in his dressing room. It was a, fr it was a Friday night they were rehearsing. So we got on the elevator, takes you right up to the studio where they do Saturday Night Live. And they were on a break. And Fred knocked on Eddie's dressing room door, and Eddie had been doing these parodies for about a year. And he didn't know who was there. He opened the door, and he saw Fred, and he backed up. <laughs> and he said, though, the real Mr. Robinson, and gave Fred a big hug. <coughs> and I took a, where somebody else 
uh, I have the picture, but somebody took a Polaroid picture of the two of them, and I have it on my bulletin board at the office. And it was a, a, a wonderful moment. Fred never did surprise Eddie on the, on the air, but he did in the dressing room. So that was a story I just thought I'd throw in. A lot of things like that have happened over my years at the neighborhood, and I'm so grateful to Fred. I'm so grateful to you sitting here listening to all of this. So speedy delivery.